Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. And we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Bugsnag. Bugsnag is mission control for software quality. And I talk with James Smith, co-founder and CEO of Bugsnag, about team communication around software errors. Software errors are not engineering only issues. They're a problem the entire organization faces. I feel like any company that has software at its core, everyone in that team should take pride in what they're building. And I think that it's pretty obvious where software teams and engineering teams in particular would use a tool like Bugsnag or error monitoring in general. But what we're seeing more and more is that if there are customer support teams start using tools like this, they, they want to have more visibility into the actual problems. We end up with customer success teams, you know, for, for account managers, for VIP customers care about if their customers have seen a crash. Even one example that we saw recently is sales teams, right? If you are getting someone interested in your product, they're doing maybe a, a trial or a pilot program. If they, your customer sees a crash during that trial or during that pilot program, that could be it. They could be out. And if you're the person who is the account manager or salesperson on that conversation, you want to know, you want to make sure that customer is having a good experience. So yeah, any company that has software, most teams in that organization are going to care about the health and the quality of that software. So as you add more visibility to these software errors to more people, you're going to end up with more communication. How does Bugsnag enable teams to better communicate around error monitoring? One thing that we I'm always surprised about is how many steps are involved in communication between a, a customer seeing a problem and that problem getting resolved. And it's almost like a game of telephone, right? So imagine you're a company that has a support team. A lot of the time, the support team can, can end up being the bad guys here, right? You end up with customer complaints, the support team pick up the ticket, maybe that gets escalated one level up to the next level of support. That team then has to figure out, hey, is this an actual software problem? Is this a bug? Or is maybe the customer just misunderstanding how to use the product? In that scenario, there's a disconnect between the customer and the engineer. You know, when I'm building software, I, I want to know if the code that I'm writing and the software that I'm building is working. Removing this game of telephone between customer, then customer success or customer support, and then the engineering team, and then all the way back again when a problem gets resolved is pretty important. So if your team has ever experienced a communication breakdown when resolving errors in your software, give Bugsnag a try. It's free to get started with a special 45-day extended trial exclusive to our listeners. Head to bugsnag.com slash changelog. You're listening to the Change Log, a podcast featuring the hackers, leaders, and innovators of open source. I'm Adam Stachowiak, editor in chief of Change Log. On today's show, Jared and I are talking to Alan Durek, co founder and CEO of Wire, an open source end to end encrypted instant messaging app for voice and video calls. Alan was a co founder of Camino Networks, which was acquired by Skype, and his involvement with internet based voice communications goes back 20 years. We talk about the early days of Skype, why Wired is open source, why it's important to be encrypted, why it's important to be secure, their polyglot ways, and how they plan to stand apart from other apps like WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal, and more. So Alan, where did the idea for Wire come from? Uh, Wire, um, as you know, a secure messaging tool for everyone and uh, idea for uh, Wire uh, came um, five years ago uh, when um, uh, us founders of uh, Wire met together with uh, Janus Fries, uh, co-founder of uh, Skype. And we had an idea there uh, to build a new Skype. And we were thinking like, okay, if you are building Skype 10 years after, how would that uh, Skype look like? And Mm. there we identified um, three gaps. uh, one was related to privacy, one was uh, related uh, to um, user experience, and the third one was uh, related uh, to um, security of uh, all of the existing uh, messaging solutions. And as you can guess, uh, all four of us uh, founders uh, were related uh, to Skype uh, one way or another. That's interesting. I mean, obviously, we're conducting this call via Skype, and I think in my history of podcasting, I could probably say there's only maybe a dozen, if that, if that. And I've done probably, I don't know, 
600 shows, 500 shows across my podcast career where they've done via Skype. And it's interesting to kind of talk to somebody that's played such a critical role in Skype for one, but then also, you know, this, this desire five years ago to want to do something better. What's wrong with Skype? Like what's wrong with this? Not so much Skype in, in a, as a product, but like what's wrong with, you know, maybe the, the type of platform, the type of thing it is, the thing it's trying to do to make wire be something that needs to, needs to exist. Actually, uh, beside this uh, privacy um, part, uh, since uh, Skype is a part of a bigger corporation, uh, their uh, business model uh, may be different uh, than what is our business uh, model. Uh, other part uh, that uh, I personally didn't like uh, was uh, that Skype, uh, uh, which from the very early days uh, had impressive encryption, uh, end-to-end encryption uh, done in a peer-to-peer way as it changed over the years uh, that encryption um, has uh, been removed from it so this is this is basically um, the main complaint uh, on mm-hmm. skype mm-hmm. other than that it's fair to say that uh, skype is uh, a still amazing uh, tool uh, that does its job uh, uh, very well and uh, they are possibly there Another big uh, disadvantage is the um, fact that Skype has a quite a bit of a baggage uh, being uh, present uh, on the market and being one of the leaders on the market uh, for now nearly 15 years. So um, a number of uh, things uh, that are holding them back relate uh, to some backwards compatibility, etc. So uh, we were lucky there that uh, we could start from the scratch, identify those gaps and uh, go for it. You mentioned that uh, one of your previous companies and uh, this, for the listeners, this isn't Alan's uh, first rodeo. This is maybe your third or fourth technology business, had many successes in in the industry. Uh, Camino Networks, I believe it was called, was bought by Skype, I think back when Skype was part of eBay. Skype has a lot. When you go back and start thinking about it, it has a long storied history as a, as a software product and team. And like you said, it's it's it has a larger corporation as a part of now. It's it's had different phases in its life. Um, what was Camino Networks, and then why why was it bought by Skype? Tell us that story a little bit. So you you've definitely uh, prepared uh, quite well for uh, this podcast since uh, Camino was uh, sold to Skype uh, roughly uh, ten. 10 years ago, uh, and uh, Camino was uh, developing uh, speech coding and uh, sound processing uh, technology that was tailored uh, for um, voice over IP networks um, so that it could uh, sustain uh, lossy networks, uh, uh, jittery networks. uh, And um, this was a piece of a technology uh, that uh, Skype was missing. uh, uh, because uh, Skype was uh, licensing that software from um, other company uh, that is uh, that was called uh, Global IP Solutions, uh, which ended up afterwards acquired uh, by Google. And uh, Global IP Solutions uh, is a company where I was uh, one of the first engineers uh, and started working uh, with uh, Skype basically in uh, 2003. So uh, I I used to joke uh, that I know Skype. Uh, when it was still called uh, Skyper. Huh. Yeah, I never knew it was called that. It, it's interesting to look at the the history of like then Camino Networks, then acquired by Skype, then Skype acquired by, it, there was like several different chains in there for it to ultimately be now owned by Microsoft. And whenever you have an idea, right, a business, an idea, technology go through so many hands, the mission to some degree must get lost or its original mission or its, its original intent somehow Changes. get, you know, disambiguated. It's, it's just, it's somehow it's, it's blurry, you know, it, it's not clear to the, mm-hmm. maybe the current status. And maybe that's why wireless here end to end encryption. It seems like maybe help for me even to, to, to understand this and the listeners too, along with us, when you're talking as we are now via Skype, what's happening? Are, are we at risk of, our conversation being overheard by someone else is, is that what's happening? As you said, the, the encryption has gone away over the years and 
what exactly is happening with communication on something like Skype? So um, risk risk of a conversation uh, being overheard uh, is uh, realistically uh, small unless uh, you are someone uh, of a particular uh, uh, interest or uh, of a particular uh, high uh, net value. And um, that information could be uh, sold uh, uh, to someone. Uh, uh, however, there is also more aspects uh, to it, uh, such as metadata related uh, to this call. Uh, so uh, it is uh, something uh, what is of a concern uh, for uh, businesses. Uh, if, uh, for instance, uh, uh, let's say like a small uh, pizza shop, uh, if um, it is using a tool as a Skype uh, or a WhatsApp, uh, and uh, if uh, their customers are contacting them with that tool, uh, uh, all of that metadata related to fact uh, uh, who was contacting them, uh, when they were contacting them, etc., is um, at disposal of uh, those large corporations uh, such as uh, Microsoft, uh, WhatsApp, uh, Google, etc. And that information then can be sold uh, directly to their competitors. So let's say like there comes a new pizza shop that is in uh, that area and uh, they can have easy access uh, to all of the customers, offer them a little bit better uh, uh, value proposition uh, or um, a little bit cheaper price uh, than uh, uh, what the original one is offering and overtake uh, their customers. And they can do it uh, with a perfectly um, legitimate way because this is something uh, what in a terms uh, and conditions uh, when you are using those tools uh, is specified that nothing uh, prevents those big uh, corporations uh, uh, from taking it. And in a similar way as well uh, uh, for for a people that are using it uh, just uh, from a pure uh, consumer uh, side, uh, uh, it can be used uh, for a profiling uh, on, on our side. Uh, and uh, uh, you've seen also um, uh, the cases uh, where uh, people are getting uh, suggestions uh, to be connected uh, to other people that they shouldn't be uh, connected uh, and um, it it can also uh, create a number of uh, scenarios uh, that um, that are quite uh, awkward and uh, also uh, potentially uh, dangerous yeah for maybe some of the listeners too they're even like why are you guys talking about skype so much like i don't even use skype anymore i don't i'm not a podcaster i don't have that many conversations. I mean, Jerry, what's your opinion? Do you think there's a lot of people unlike us? Like we record this show and our shows across Skype. Is there a massive user count for Skype? I mean, are we boring people with the conversation around Skype? Do you think? I think there's a massive user count for Skype because of what Alan said, which is how long it's been around right, the 15 ish years. Yeah. One of the reasons, you know, why we use Skype for podcasting uh, is because of the the call quality relative to others and it has a lot of technology in there around uh, making sure that, you know, network glitches don't cause as many problems as they do. There still are issues. But the other thing is um, most people have a Skype account. That doesn't mean they're using Skype, right. but it's just been around. It's like, a, you know, AOL messenger. Most people have an aim account somewhere. Down yeah, right. there. Okay. It, so that is a barrier that we usually do not have. Sometimes we do like Alan had to install Skype and, I probably had to dig up his old username in order to, to make this call with us. Um, so there is a network effect there, but it's not like, you know, it's not the cool kid on the block. People aren't excited about Skype or using it because they want to. It's just kind of because that's what's always been there and it's been good. And there hasn't been much um, innovation and competition yeah. in that marketplace until recently. And there's a lot now. Um, there's, gosh, I was looking at, at your website there, Alan, and the you guys have a nice matrix, you know, kind of a feature matrix uh, with other offerings. And there's Skype for Business, Microsoft Teams, Slack, WhatsApp. There's Facebook Messenger. There's Telegram. There's Signal. Um, there's a lot of people who are trying to make waves in the chat and voice and video space. Um, the reasons why, you know, we invite you on the show, one of the major thing is that Wire is completely open source. And so we're not talking with Facebook Messenger today because they're not open source. And, you know, we think open source is cool. And especially when it comes to privacy and these kinds of encryption, we think open source is important. So 
why are you guys open source? Why is Wire open source? Tell us about the decision to do that. Uh, so um, the main reason why we uh, went open source is uh, when you have piece of a software, especially one which is a communication tool, and security with privacy is in its core. I see there of uh, utmost importance uh, to be fully transparent about it, uh, what you are doing with your software. And uh, this, is, this is something uh, that we owe to our uh, users and we owe uh, to our customers. Uh, and I usually say uh, to uh, all of my uh, colleagues, uh, friends that are not um, much in the uh, security uh, area, uh, why, uh, when they are buying uh, security related products, uh, uh, whenever they hear that something is a military grade encryption or military grade security, and if it is not an open source, stay away from it. Yeah. This is something uh, that is, I think, uh, also going to become a norm uh, for most solutions that are going to be uh, coming out uh, on the market. Uh, uh, so this is when looking things uh, from a company's uh, perspective. And uh, what is really cool is that uh, once when we open sourced uh, our um, client uh, fully, we started getting uh, calls uh, from a number of largest world corporations uh, from automotive industry, uh, uh, some of them in the banking uh, sector, uh, some of them in a pharma, which haven't contacted us before we were open sourced. So it was a big proof that uh, being transparent is uh, already uh, paying off uh, quite nicely and it's going to be paying off uh, even more by the times to come. So this is uh, reasoning when looking from a company's perspective. Uh, and uh, when looking uh, from individuals' uh, perspective, uh, it is also something that um, pretty much all of our team members uh, see as employment benefit. And uh, yeah. they love that they are working with the open source. Uh, they love uh, that they can show uh, to their friends and family, uh, what they are working with. Uh, they are very proud of it. Uh, and uh, also personally for me, this is a big thing uh, because I've been involved in open source uh, now basically for uh, 21 years, uh, starting with a Slackware uh, back in an ID6, uh, then through a ILBC codec and a number of other initiatives. Mm. And uh, it also uh, helped us a lot uh, to recruit some of the top talent, uh, which told us uh, that uh, for them, uh, this was a decision making uh, point that we wow. were open uh, compared to some other uh, options uh, that they had in front of them. Well, to a certain degree here, Alan, you're, you're preaching to the choir because we, we see the value in doing it. We, we think it's overwhelming to keeping it closed source. But was there internally uh, your CEO and co-founder, as you mentioned, you have some other founders and some other people who are in leadership at Wire. Maybe you even have a board of directors. I'm not sure how the company is all laid out, but was there, did you have to pitch this? Was there an advocacy internally? Was there debate around whether or not to do it or did it, was it a no brainer uh, for everybody involved? Uh, ex excellent question. And, uh, 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 of course you are onto something, uh, uh, since uh, also among our investors, uh, there wasn't a uh, unanimous uh, decision uh, and um, sympathy towards open source. Uh, there were also some concerns uh, from one part of them uh, that haven't been working uh, with uh, open source uh, before. And there was also a bit of a skepticism uh, uh, how market uh, is going to respond uh, to it. Uh, uh, but... Um, they were still uh, very supportive and uh, after uh, really good argumentation was uh, presented for open source, uh, we all decided uh, together to go for it. Uh, and uh, ever since uh, they were extremely pleased uh, with results uh, of going open source. And uh, I'm also glad uh, that we expanded uh, a network among investors uh, that are now strong supporters uh, for open source. Well, it's interesting in hindsight to look at the way that open source has been a benefit. And this may not be something that seems very clear to, to everybody listening or to those who are newer to the idea of open sourcing everything, so to speak. 
is that you've been able to attract and acquire customers or at least entertain the idea of them using wire that wasn't prior to open source. You've been able to attract talent. And now it seems you've certainly won over, you know, the co-founders and investors in wire to say open source is the way that's a hard thing for some people to really get. And I think even for us, Jared, like our CMS is open source. And when we were first thinking about, you know, that technology, building that, you know, the, the thing I think we often hear is like, well, that's, that's awesome that you did that, but you know, you've given away, you know, your everything essentially. And I don't, I don't see it as that. I see it as like what Alan is saying here is this full transparency. We have nothing to hide and all it does is get us all the benefits. Alan, is that how you see open source? You said before in the pre-call how, how big you are on open source. Is that, is that part of the reason why you're so big on open source? Absolutely. And, um, my previous jobs, I was uh, fortunate uh, enough uh, that um, uh, I could have um, start Codec uh, that is uh, called ILBC uh, from a business idea around it uh, to make it uh, also first as a part of a freeware uh, open source it. Uh, and thanks to that experience, um, we've seen how um, it helped to enable uh, something uh, what was massive afterwards. Uh, uh, if you look a little bit back um, some um, 15, 20 years ago, um, uh, you needed uh, to spend uh, quite a bit of uh, money to license um, speech coding technology that was working reasonably well on internet. Mm. And companies like Skype, they uh, didn't have at that time uh, possibility uh, to use some of uh, those codecs uh, uh, that were free or that were uh, licensed uh, then uh, from a global IP solutions uh, uh, in a way that was uh, not prohibiting them to grow uh, from the start. Uh, I don't think we would have had uh, today uh, free calls uh, practically everywhere uh, on, on mobile, uh, on mobile phones, uh, on desktop, uh, uh, video calls, uh, etc. Uh, this helped in a great manner, quite a bit of innovation that was happening afterwards in the field of uh, internet communications, messaging space, uh, voice over IP, etc. And um, in the same way, uh, I see things uh, happening in uh, security and also uh, open sourcing uh, some of the critical uh, components there, inspiring uh, a number of um, other developers uh, out there inspiring also a number of other companies uh, to create uh, uh, good solutions, uh, secure solutions. Yeah. And ultimately then at uh, some point of time, uh, hopefully uh, gaining uh, the same adoption rate as uh, we gain uh, on the uh, speech coding side uh, with uh, WebRTC uh, being open sourced um, from Google at, um, at some point of time. And as you may know, uh, most of uh, the code uh, that was uh, open sourced uh, at the very beginning uh, for WebRTC was again uh, global IP solutions code uh, that uh, Google acquired. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I wanted to make sure that we, if not gone deep here, because maybe now is not the right time, but mentioned that ILBC is Internet Low Bitrate Codec, which ultimately became WebRTC. It was initially released, this is all based on Wikipedia, so this is free information, we'll, we'll link in the show notes, but initial release was 2004, written in C, and uses a three-clause uh, BSD license, but is now owned by Google and was ultimately open, in, you know, turned into WebRTC. So this, all this work that you're seeing that helped you have faith and believe in open source was this initial codec, which became WebRTC. So like, for those listening, like, that's a massive amount of history and a huge lesson for Alan to learn around this thing. I mean, that's that's just so crazy to hear that backstory. And today we have WebRTC. It's it's just amazing how that that thing there for you is what gives you faith and started your faith in open source and and what has ultimately helped you build wire. Absolutely. So that that's been an uh, incredible uh, journey and uh, really proud of it that the ILBC. Uh, became a seed uh, for um, 
this uh, what afterwards uh, turned into a something uh, really uh, spectacular uh, used by billions of uh, people uh, and um, also at the time um, back in uh, 2001 uh, when i was taking ilbc uh, uh, to itf uh, to standardize it uh, people thought that i'm crazy that itf uh, would never take it but uh, uh, i was fortunate as well uh, to have uh, some of the visionaries uh, uh, there at ITF uh, that accepted it. And then after that, uh, we took uh, Codec uh, to another standardization um, community or uh, cable labs, and uh, it got also accepted there. And uh, it wouldn't be accepted there if it wasn't uh, free and uh, if it wasn't open source. And uh, from that point uh, onwards, uh, it uh, set the standards uh, for any kind of um, speech uh, coding technology and video coding uh, technology uh, uh, that uh, wanted a high adoption rate. That's amazing. Let me, uh, for the sake of conversation, let me play the the bear for, for a minute with you, Alan, because as you said, internally, it was not unanimous. And so no doubt you had interesting conversations with your colleagues and uh, leadership at WIRE around this. Um, and one of the major points brought up by people who are skeptical of open sourcing, I think, is a legitimate skepticism with regard to ripoffs. Um, ripoffs happen, and uh, the more successful you are, the more they can happen. Uh, in fact, just recently I was reading about a, uh, a crypto coin wallet called Coinami, which I think mm -hmm. is an Android only thing now. And I was just reading about their history in a little bit. These things, you know, interest me. And uh, they were open source. I think it was GPL'd even. And their Android application was all open source on GitHub. And they were doing it all in the open, which makes a lot of sense for a crypto wallet as well, because talk about you wanted to know what the code is doing. Um, similar to an encryption type of a secure chat, you want to know what's going on under the hood. And so it made sense for them to be open source. Well, uh, what happened was other people who were ve being very capitalistic, decided they were going to just take that code, rename it, rebrand it, and put it on the Android store. Um, this is not an isolated incident. We see this happening over and over. The Koinami folks ended up, st they they stopped open sourcing. They decided it wasn't worth it for them anymore. I, I believe that repo is still on GitHub, but it hasn't been updated in a few years, and they've marked it as inactive. And so they've continued to develop the code base closed because they had these problems. Um, was this a, a potential reason not to open source discussed at WIRE? Because surely if, if everything you do is in the open, uh, somebody could just take all of your code and all you're doing and rebrand it and compete with you. Definitely uh, something uh, what, uh, what uh, has been brought up uh, by our uh, investors as a concern and uh, Definitely a valid concern. And uh, as you've seen uh, in the case that uh, you described, uh, we have also a couple of more cases, uh, unfortunate cases uh, uh, like that. Um, they're um, really awful stuff uh, has happened yeah. uh, uh, with, with the open source. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that, that those are only exceptions. Uh, and uh, I hope as well uh, that uh, there are good legal ways, and I know that there are how to protect those companies uh, that uh, have been ripped off in a this way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that um, legal system should uh, protect it, and as well, I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. that the community and the opinion makers uh, are not going to be positive about uh, those solutions uh, that uh, completely. Uh, ripped it off. Uh, so it's it's also important uh, that uh, opinion makers and uh, the ones uh, are strong influencers towards uh, the uh, customers of um, such uh, solutions uh, that they make sure that uh, people stay away from uh, solutions that are basically a uh, classic uh, ripoffs. Though. Mm -hmm. It is it is a hard way, and uh, we know that it's that uh, there are gonna be the cases uh, when uh, such things are gonna be happening. Uh, but um, on uh, every negative uh, case, uh, I trust uh, we have another ten positive cases. Yeah. Uh, 
well, we we need uh, uh, we need uh, to uh, continue pushing in the same direction, uh, and uh, uh, we need also uh, there uh, uh, to to help uh, those ones uh, that uh, got hurt during this effort. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean, who just launched Spaces, a beautifully simple object storage service designed for developers who want a simple way to store and serve a vast amount of data, such as hosting web assets, storing user-generated content, such as images and large media files, archiving backups in the cloud, and storing logs. Just like you use S3, Spaces has an ecosystem of S3 compatible tools and libraries that can be used to manage your space. And it's available independent of DigitalOcean servers. You don't need to use anything else, but just Spaces if you want. And to make it easy to try for both new and existing DigitalOcean customers, you can get started today with a free two month trial of Spaces by going to do.co slash changelog. And for new customers only, you'll also receive a $10 credit to use for DigitalOcean droplets or other services. Once again, do.co slash changelog. And by GoCD. GoCD is an open source continuous delivery server built by ThoughtWorks. GoCD provides continuous delivery out of the box with its built-in pipelines, advanced traceability, and value stream visualization. With GoCD, you can easily model, orchestrate, and visualize complex workflows from end to end. It supports modern infrastructure with elastic on-demand agents and cloud deployments. And their plugin ecosystem ensures GoCD will work well in your unique environment. To learn more about GoCD, visit gocd.org slash changelog. It's free to use and has professional support for enterprise add-ons available from ThoughtWorks. Once again, gocd.org slash changelog. So Alan, Wired has a lot of competition, which is great. There's lots of companies and individuals trying to provide solutions in the uh, chat and video and voice space, and, and we need that. Um, there are many alternatives. There's even many open source alternatives. In fact, Telegram and Signal are both open source. Somewhat uh, interestingly, or at least it's interesting to me, uh, Adam actually found Signal and said, hey, we should do a show on Signal. And I had already invited you on and I said, oh, well, we're doing a show on wire. And it was just kind of like almost almost simultaneous discovery. Only I beat him by maybe a day. And so we thought about having you know, the signal team on because they're doing very similar things. So uh, curious what sets wire apart from the competition, even amongst those who are security focused and open source as well. What's the what's the wire secret sauce? Uh, when. Um you look at uh, the current landscape. Uh, on one side, uh, uh, you have uh, applications uh, that are um, secure using end-to-end -end encryption, uh, such as a Signal uh, or a WhatsApp. Uh, uh, but a Telegram, uh, I would uh, also have um, some reserve uh, because their default mode is not end-to-end -end encrypted. And um, uh, according uh, uh, to uh, different sources, uh, most of um, conversations on Telegram uh, are not really end-to-end -end encrypted. But uh, nevertheless, when we look at the applications uh, such as a Signal, uh, WhatsApp, that are general purpose applications uh, and uh, that are easy to use and that are secure, uh, they are not uh, applications uh, that uh, are meant to be used uh, for the businesses. Uh, uh, you don't have their um, uh, possibility uh, to uh, add someone to the group or uh, take out someone out of the, uh, out of the group administrator that uh, you don't have the group calls and the number of uh, screen sharing and the number of other functions uh, that you would expect in a business environment. So um, this is one side of the landscape. Then you have the other side of the landscape uh, with the business tools uh, such as uh, Slack, uh, uh, Microsoft Teams uh, or um, uh, Facebook uh, Workplace, uh, uh, which are tools that are not really secure, that are not uh, really using end-to-end -end, uh, 
encryption. And also, in addition, those are tools uh, that are not uh, easy to be used uh, by people that are not um, in IT world and that are not uh, tech savvy. And uh, Wire is uh, really there addressing this uh, sweet spot uh, so that it uh, can be used uh, by consumers. Uh, so uh, with Wire, you can have a consumer profile and then you can have your business profile in the same way uh, that, for instance, uh, you would do it um, uh, with your email client, whether it's uh, Apple Mail uh, or um, Outlook, uh, you can have one account uh, there, which is your private account, and then you have uh, the other account, uh, which is your business account. And you can nicely um, uh, keep those uh, apart uh, if you want. Uh, and um, this is this is basically uh, unique with a wire that you can use it both uh, for a business uh, and for your private use, uh, and that it is uh, super secure and uh, it is really uh, super simple to be used. Uh, it is, a, as, as, as we say, like a general purpose application. And as you know, in the past, uh, there have been a number of uh, really uh, super secure tools uh, like PGP uh, email, uh, but um, they were really cumbersome to be used. And then uh, uh, companies and people uh, that really needed uh, to use it or that they depended on it, uh, they were usually, uh, for, usually falling back uh, to uh, solutions uh, that were easier to use, uh, but were not necessarily uh, secure. Hmm. One point that you that you emphasize on the website, which maybe I need more explanation because I'm not very familiar with, and perhaps other people as well, is that you're Europe-based, and so there's European privacy laws um, in place. Can you explain why that's relevant and important when you're you know, picking a tool like this? So um, European uh, laws uh, from privacy point uh, of view are uh, more protective of the um, consumers and more protective uh, uh, for uh, businesses. Uh, there is a really uh, high threshold that needs to be passed uh, in order uh, uh, to get uh, any kind of um, uh, very confidential information, uh, especially when uh, compared it uh, to U.S. Uh, or um, some other jurisdictions. And also, I guess part of that, too, is being Switzerland based. Why is it specific to mention Switzerland is I know that um, it's pretty well known for like having a Swiss bank account. You hear that in the movies and it's this thing like, oh, you can't get me here. It's this, you know, neutrality kind of thing. Is that part of uh, the tail end to Jared's question to you? Up to a certain extent, uh, but uh, it is uh, really what it is uh, there, why uh, why we chose uh, Switzerland uh, for uh, our jurisdiction was that at that time, uh, privacy laws uh, uh, were even more favorable uh, than European Union laws. Uh, and uh, uh, now Swiss and uh, EU privacy laws uh, are on pair. Uh, so uh, over a time, uh, uh, European uh, laws as well uh, emerged further and um, are protecting uh, uh, consumers and businesses in the same way as uh, Swiss one does. And other reason also why we went uh, for Switzerland uh, was um, that uh, there is a favorable uh, regime uh, with respect to um, keeping your intellectual uh, property. I guess one thing we can probably dive into a little bit further is is what you really mean by secure and mainly for breaking it down for everyone else to really understand that. Because on your matrix that we mentioned in the, the previous section, uh, it says secure equals everything secured with end to end encryption, which people may say that quite a bit. Uh, maybe it means one thing for someone else. Maybe it means another thing for you, but you've got a a entire page dedicated to describing what you mean by secured with end-to-end -end encryption and protected by European privacy laws, which you described as, you know, more robust and uh, and more comprehensive. Can we kind of walk through some of the, the information shared at wire.com slash security? You got end-to-end -end encrypted, independently audited, multi-device messaging. These are pretty interesting things. I think that people don't really break down unless they have to break them down. So to say that uh, new encryption keys are used for each message. So 
you know, if one's compromised, it's, you know, a key has minimal impact or how you can use many, you know, several devices. Can you start breaking down some of the end end encryption details that you all uh, employ? So basically, um, you already hit uh, all uh, the most important uh, aspects of uh, this being really secure. Uh, so with uh, uh, end-to-end encryption, you are rising a threshold uh, for those uh, that uh, want to exploit your platform uh, extremely high. So uh, for instance, if um, three of us uh, have um, multiple charts uh, and also some uh, group charts in a various uh, combinations uh, uh, for someone in order uh, to know everything that we are uh, talking they would need uh, to break into uh, every one of us uh, devices so like exploiting uh, the wire network uh, uh, would not give them anything uh, because uh, wire network uh, uh, keeps all of this information um, uh, encrypted and uh, not only that if uh, someone would like uh, to exploit uh, this data from outside but also if um, we have a uh, someone inside wire that uh, would like to take advantage of uh, their position uh, yeah. being employee at wire they cannot take that advantage because all of the data that we have is uh, pretty much useless so uh, here what is what is really important is that um, you are putting this barrier for exploit very high and imagine like if uh, if you are a bank uh, uh, with a millions uh, of uh, customers uh, or uh, if you are legal office also with a thousands uh, uh, of uh, customers uh, in order uh, to get uh, uh, data uh, that um, that is uh, currently being obtained uh, uh, with exploits that are happening uh, that you've seen uh, recently uh, with uh, Deloitte or uh, uh, KPMG or even Slack uh, some time ago, um, you you have all of those users' information at your hand once when you get into their cloud. So, of course, when someone from the outside uh, wants uh, to take advantage of a specific platform, uh, they are likely to go uh, for that one where it's way easier to get uh, into it. So uh, using equivalent, like if uh, your home is uh, protected uh, uh, with the video surveillance, uh, if uh, it has uh, doors uh, that um, are the most sophisticated uh, ones uh, using all of those anti-burglar features, uh, if uh, your home is also uh, being surveilled uh, by security. And then there is a someone else home uh, uh, who is not being uh, surveilled uh, by security uh, and uh, doesn't have um, video camera surveillance. And uh, it has just the simple doors uh, that are easy uh, to break in. And the uh, value of stuff that would be found in uh, two of those homes is uh, similar. Of course, burglars are going to go there where it's way easier and where uh, there is a way less risk uh, to get it. And uh, similarly, um, as mentioned, uh, like if we have customers uh, that have a very sensitive uh, data that uh, their businesses depend on uh, or that even their lives uh, may depend on, uh, uh, they are not left at mercy of uh, our employees in our company because uh, if uh, even if uh, if they were the ones with the bad intentions uh, they wouldn't be able uh, to extract much uh, from the data that uh, that we hold there so uh, this is also a difference in uh, our approach uh, towards the data of our customers uh, uh, for instance uh, some of the companies uh, take it and uh, they say like uh, that uh, data is a new oil uh, for us uh, data that our customers have uh, could be more seen as a nuclear waste and <laughs> that's an interesting perspective exactly and uh, uh, we we know that we need uh, to handle it uh, with a care and uh, we handle it uh, with a care that our ar- architecture and everything is uh, addressing it so data as oil with regards to let's just take customer chats chat messages text is um you know 
is bad for me as a customer if you're using that oil right to power revenue through some other mechanism but it's it's powerful for me if you're feeding back into my user experience if you're improving the product with my data which i've put into the system so one of your rivals a centralized you know business rival is slack which is dominating the small business and startup and really the developer sphere um, with regards to just usage like you know, the joke now is, you know, <laughs> you have too many slacks. And so everybody invites you into their slack and you don't want to join another slack because you already have 18 slacks, by the way, change log slack, check us out, channel.com slash community. <laughs> so right. we have one, um, and ease of use and some of the features provided by centralization are really nice. And so we have this age old compromise between security and ease of use or security and f- rich feature set. With Wire, you're saying it's easy to use, it has a rich feature set, and it has security. There's no compromises. Um, I'm taking that right off your features page. It says no compromises. Surely there's some compromises. There has to be, you know, you're giving up something, right? Are, are there things that Slack can do that you just can't do with Wire because of the architecture of the centralized uh, data stores? Some of the features uh, which uh, Slack is uh, developing are easier to develop uh, if you don't. Uh, need to think about uh, uh, end-to-end uh, encryption. Uh, but uh, mm-hmm. I'm pretty much sure uh, that they are uh, quite aware of uh, all of the potential hazards uh, that uh, hack into Slack uh, uh, would uh, cause uh, to their users. And I'm pretty much sure also that they are working uh, on end-to-end encryption. Uh, and uh, in the same way as, uh, for instance, uh, a big um, food and grocery uh, supermarkets uh, uh, like Safeway uh, in US, uh, uh, they have like normal food uh, section and then they have a healthy food section. And mm-hmm. uh, as, as awareness uh, about hazards uh, of uh, security exploits is rising, uh, everyone is going to have uh, their own, within quotation, uh, healthy food section, uh, whether it is a Microsoft uh, or if it is a Slack uh, or or anyone else. So this is this is one of my uh, predictions uh, for the next uh, couple of years uh, for the market of uh, business communications. And uh, their first goal is uh, uh, to move um, business users away from email because also uh, uh, email is uh, one of the weakest uh, links uh, or the weakest link in the chain. So for a sensitive uh, corporate information uh, People should never use email. Uh, and uh, uh, when um, compared uh, further um, with Slack, I seriously doubt that um, it can um, improve uh, quite much user experience uh, data that you get by digging uh, any company's uh, uh, charts and information, uh, which is a chart. Uh, I would be very keen on, uh, on uh, seeing uh, really some of uh, those use cases and uh, see how it is uh, really improving uh, productivity or a user experience. Uh, hmm. I think the the interesting thing here is that uh, we have seen, you know, in Twitter and Facebook, we've seen some rogue employees do some things that uh, has been detrimental to their brand to some degree, in large degrees, you know, doing things on their way out, their last day of work, you know. So in, in your case where you say with Wire, um, the fact that the encryption is happening elsewhere, not so much that if you take over wires network that you don't have access to all the keys in the kingdom, you have, you know, maybe a limited access or something where you can't really go into the individualized clients and things like that. So you're in a a position where that seems to be a foundational DNA of how you move forward with developing product. Can you describe, I think you kind of touched a little bit on it where, you said Slack could do something, but then you could also do it as well if you thought about it from a certain perspective. Can you kind of walk us through what that looks like to have that as a foundational DNA of you know new feature development to to operate in a way that remains with the integrity of keeping things secure? Mm-hmm. Yeah, excellent question and also a very difficult question. So I hope <laughs> um, I'll be able to explain it uh, in a in a simple uh, words. Uh, so basically what is uh, happening uh, with the end-to-end encryption, uh, we have cloud communication uh, model uh, fundamentally changing. 
So for instance, uh, some of the core functionality that um, relies on a cloud, uh, let's say like a search in a Slack. Search is happening uh, in the cloud. Uh, uh, for us, search cannot happen uh, in the cloud on the content of uh, the conversations uh, uh, simply because everything is encrypted and we have no clue if a certain message uh, that uh, passed uh, uh, through our cloud is, uh, for instance, uh, a call that I'm making to you, if it is a text message, uh, if it is a just uh, acknowledgement of the message that you sent to me and you are getting a back uh, delivery receipt, or if it is a file that was sent or a screen uh, that is being shared uh, for all those messages, uh, you, you have no clue really um, uh, what is happening there. So search cannot be done in the core. Also, um, a number of other functions, uh, such as a sync uh, across different devices, uh, depend heavily on endpoints. So you have a hybrid logic where uh, most of the intelligence uh, is uh, moved towards the endpoints, but there is uh, still some intelligence uh, that is uh, in the cloud. And uh, we've seen this in the past uh, uh, in a communication networks. Uh, for instance, you had intelligent network in telecoms uh, where all of the intelligence uh, was in the cloud. Then with the rise of a Skype, uh, we had the peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, distributed, uh, fully distributed model where all of the intelligence uh, moved back uh, uh, to the endpoints or uh, to the peers of the network, to the peer uh, of the network. And uh, now Pendulum is again uh, swinging. Uh, uh, so it went to uh, cloud. Everything uh, was moved uh, to the cloud. All intelligence is in the cloud. And now Pendulum is uh, swinging again and uh, going uh, more towards the endpoints. And uh, we have this uh, hybrid model. So. Um, with this in mind, as mentioned, uh, any feature that you are developing, it needs to be uh, developed um, in a quite different way than uh, if you uh, do not encrypt uh, the data. So it, it has some overhead. Uh, it has uh, a tougher testing, uh, tougher test uh, automation, etc. But uh, we are committed to it and uh, we know that uh, this is uh, the right way forward. Do you believe that the consumers will come with you on the way forward? Because a, a disturbing trend that I see, and heck, I even see it in myself sometimes, even knowing all the implications and the problems and uh, with privacy, is we all want it until it's inconvenient. And even the smallest inconvenience, we just throw it out the window. And uh, or not even inconvenient, There's or we have a shiny feature that <laughs> that is you know, dangled in front of us. And we say, oh, that's really cool, especially now with a lot of the, uh, you know, applying a lot of the machine learning to our to our historical data and and the neat things that you can do with that, you know, positioning yourself very much as the secure way to message. Um, as you said, the pendulum has swung back and forth, but won't you see it potentially swinging away from you as consumers continue to sometimes, you know, frustratingly choose convenience slash features over privacy? You have a fantastic uh, point there and uh, we are quite much aware of it. Uh, so I also um, like to see it uh, from a couple of perspectives. Uh, one is uh, related uh, to awareness uh, and uh, this sociological or anthropological view on it is quite important. Uh, and uh, there needs to be more awareness of um, all of the issues that are happening with abuse of our privacy. And uh, I also uh, like to compare awareness and the knowledge of the hazards of a passive smoking uh, some 20 to 30 years ago when I was a kid to um, all of the hazards of uh, exploits of um, our privacy uh, today. In the times uh, to come, um, we'll see, I'm pretty much sure also some of the massive uh, lawsuits over this happening if uh, this doesn't start changing. Because the basic uh, problem there is uh, who's watching the watchman. And uh, we know that uh, companies like uh, Facebook and Google uh, heavily depend 
on uh, products that are free to consumers. And we know that it is not free because uh, consumer is their, uh, the, the product and uh, how they can increase uh, their valuation because all of them are publicly traded companies. They are already serving 1 billion of uh, people uh, that uh, have 98% of uh, the wealth. So the only way to um, heavily increase their profitability is by exploiting our privacy uh, further. And um, also uh, with these uh, profiles that are made of us uh, based on our usage of their services, uh, what those profiles are going to be used for. And then uh, also um, there is definitely a room uh, with uh, adversarial models uh, to influence uh, other people's profiles because, you know, my profile is also created uh, by a pattern of um, usage uh, with uh, my other uh, friends, uh, co-workers, etc. And uh, other sites uh, also can uh, play with my profile um, easily and um, mess it up heavily. So um, those are the things uh, that uh, um, we'll be um, seeing in the future that um, can uh, impact our life um, in a great manner. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there is uh, no good way to um, make sure that uh, those massive abuses uh, do not happen. This episode is brought to you by our friends at TopTal, the best place to work as a freelancer or hire the top 3% of freelance talent for developers, designers, and finance experts. In this segment, I talk with Jeff Mazur. My name is Jeff Mazur, and I'm a TopTal finance expert. And we're talking about cryptocurrencies, funding early stage ideas with ICOs, and specifically, I asked Jeff to speculate on Falcoin. To me, it's one of these things where um, it makes a lot of sense on paper, and I think the the uh, white paper is kind of well reasoned and well thought out. But we just haven't seen the the uh, evidence, you know, that it really works. And if you think about a typical venture capital deal, you know, it's much the same type of thing because a lot of times companies will raise money from professional investors, from experienced, you know, early stage investors for an idea that looks great on paper, but before it's still proven to work in reality. And uh, Filepoint is much the same thing. It looks it looks great on paper, and it looks like it should work, but you know, but it's still too early to say, um, you know, to say if it's going to prove out to be, you know, uh, workable, scalable, and sustainable. And that thing, I believe, the token sold out in hours. I believe less than twenty four hours. Wasn't that right? Yeah. They raised a huge amount of money, but they also raised money in a pre-sale from uh, from what uh, they referred to as advisors. You know, so there venture ca- there were some venture capitalists and there were some people in Silicon Valley who invested in the in the um, you know in the project early, uh, which caused some commentary, both positive and negative, in the you know kind of the cryptocurrency community. So if you're looking to freelance or you're looking to gain access to a network of top industry experts in development, design, or finance. Head to TopTal.com and tell them Adam from the Change Dog sent you. That's T-O-P-T-A-L.com. And for those out there wanting a more personal introduction, email me, Adam at ChangeLaw.com. So, Alan, we can't help but notice. We're looking at your design and we're looking at the way that you present the business, which is quite, uh, quite impressive. One thing that I'm impressed by is that domain. So you're listening, you're talking to a developer audience. We nerd out about the littlest things and domains and domain hacks. And you got wire.com, four letters, easy to spell, the exact name of your business. How'd you go about getting that? And it had to be expensive. It is expensive, uh, though, um, five, five years ago when we acquired it, uh, 
it was visibly less expensive uh, than uh, what, what it is today. And uh, as, as you can imagine, um, at that time, um, uh, we had in the same way as we have now uh, big plans, uh, big idea, big mission, and we needed also a big name. Uh, so from the very beginning, uh, uh, we've been very careful about uh, uh, brand building, uh, about architecture of the system uh, that, uh, that we have built uh, choices that we took there. So backend is, uh, for instance, completely written uh, in Haskell, uh, able to scale uh, in a hundreds of millions uh, of uh, users uh, and a number of things that uh, were done uh, from the very beginning uh, were done in a very solid uh, way. Yeah, that leads into what we wanted to talk to you about a little bit was the technology choices you know, around the different things. So uh, when we say that Wire is open source, a lot of times with businesses, they'll just open source their clients or their client libraries, but there's tons of open source stuff. So check that out in the show notes. They have the server, they have components, they have all the different uh, individual clients. Um, and just looking at it a little bit, like you said, the server side is written in Haskell. There's protocol libraries that are written in Rust. You have C libraries. Um, the iOS app is Objective-C and Swift. The Android app is Java, so you're using native languages for their platforms. Uh, there's a desktop app, which is an Electron thing, which wraps uh, the web app, which is a React thing. So you're very much picking the technologies that fit into the particular platforms and not going for a cross-platform solution or even a React Native or something like that. And it seems like that plays into your desire for this big play. Like you took the time, you bought the domain, right? You spent all that money, you're designing it for this big idea. Um, I think let's start off talking about your your native iOS and Android apps. And mm -hmm. it, are we right when we say that the reason that you're you're using the native languages is because you care so much about the native experience that you'll pay, you know, the time and the labor to get that done. Who makes those decisions, and and are we are we sensing what uh, what we think we are? Mm -hmm. uh, really, really well uh, uh, spotted uh, from your side. Uh, so, for instance, uh, on the um, mobile clients side, uh, with uh, Android and uh, iOS. Uh, uh, we broke their uh, architecture in a two-tier model, where functionality uh, related uh, to um, UI is um, written in um, uh, Java on the Android uh, side and the Objective-C uh, on the uh, UI side, and now more and more of a code uh, they're done in uh, Swift, while the second part uh, we call uh, Sync Engine which does pretty much uh, all of uh, the hard lifting work um, on the client side. So uh, all of the communication uh, towards back and uh, uh, then parts uh, uh, related uh, to uh, synchronizing uh, state uh, uh, across multiple uh, devices um, and um, also um, doing the parts uh, related uh, uh, to um, encryption uh, parts also related uh, to uh, speech coding, uh, uh, video coding. Uh, so there, this sync engine uh, layer is written in uh, what we found uh, the best uh, to suit also all this uh, logic and the business logic for a specific platform. So on Android side, uh, we picked uh, Scala and uh, on iOS side, uh, uh, we picked uh, Swift. And I'm there quite mm -hmm. proud. Uh, that we were one of the first uh, applications uh, in the App Store that uh, had been deployed uh, with a quite much of a code base in Swift. And that's also a lot uh, thanks to uh, one of our uh, team members uh, that used to work uh, with Apple for a number of years. Uh, so we've been always uh, pushing their boundary and uh, picking up solutions that are uh, giving the best native experience. And uh, you see there, with this native experience um, also comes uh, battery life. Uh, so on, on that side, uh, it, is, it is really important uh, to uh, preserve the battery life um, as, as much as possible. And uh, this is also where this native experience uh, is uh, helping us. But however, we are not uh, there fully as 
you would say, religious. Uh, so certain parts, we still do cross-platform. So as you notice, uh, Prodeus Ribery, which uh, is um, uh, basically dealing uh, with uh, core encryption stuff, uh, that one is written in Rust, and it nicely uh, runs uh, cross-platform. Or, for instance, uh, this code uh, that you spotted uh, that is written in uh, C, uh, it is related uh, to um, audio-video libraries. And that one also is uh, quite nicely optimized and is uh, running uh, across, uh, across different uh, mobile platforms. Uh, so we've, we've been there quite pragmatic and uh, we took a quite careful uh, thought uh, about the choices uh, that we were making. And uh, basically, uh, all of the choices uh, have been done uh, uh, by um, my team and me uh, together. And uh, there is always a uh, healthy discussions uh, when we have those architecture discussions. And uh, uh, they, are, they are always fun and uh, they are always uh, mind challenging. Yeah. It's so polyglot. It makes me curious how you found and and hired your team, and how many of them came from your previous companies. Because you know you hear a lot of times we're a we're a Java shop, we're a Ruby shop, we we do Node, but uh, Wire has to be in so many different places that you just have all these different technologies, which are diverse and some of are very niche. I mean, Haskell. There aren't too many people who would you know kick off a uh, business uh, with a Haskell server. So tell us about your team and, and where they come from. Who are these people? Those, those are people uh, that are really also, uh, beside uh, being a top-notch uh, coders or uh, technicians, uh, also um, really um, good, intrinsically good and uh, fun people uh, to work with. And uh, a number of them um, came uh, from um, our previous startups. So uh, that startup that was uh, sold... Uh, uh, to Skype uh, once when it became uh, part of a Microsoft, uh, it wasn't any more uh, fun uh, for those guys uh, to be part of a massive big uh, corporation. And then by presenting them our mission, a number of them uh, joined uh, from the very early beginning. And uh, also a number of early Skype employees uh, joined us uh, and uh, also a number of employees uh, from my uh, previous startup, um, Telio, which was a voiceover IP uh, operator in uh, Europe. So with number of uh, team members, uh, uh, I've been working or uh, my other uh, colleagues uh, have been working for five, 10, uh, even 15, and in one case, even 20 years. Uh, so uh, mm. uh, that was the um, early team, uh, core team. And uh, then when you have a bunch of uh, clever, talented uh, people that are fun people, uh, then you also attract a number of other great guys. Uh, so uh, uh, from the very beginning, uh, we needed a really um, fantastic backend uh, that scales a lot. And as you know, Skype didn't have much of a backend. Uh, so um, since we placed our team in Berlin uh, and uh, since we had fantastic mission uh, and since we had already a bunch of uh, cool people on board, we managed to get a number of uh, guys uh, that uh, made uh, SoundClouds backend. And, uh, mm. Uh, there, part of that backend have been written in Haskell, uh, and those are guys uh, that were coding uh, Haskell in their spare time. And uh, by joining Wire, uh, they could do uh, their fun work also during the work hours. So it was very easy to recruit um, a number of those guys. And then uh, as, as you attract uh, uh, those people, then you attract also a number of other talented engineers uh, that... Um, are working around the world uh, with the Rust or with the uh, Haskell. Uh, and uh, uh, Berlin is really a fun place uh, to live at. And uh, it is a kind of a melting pot uh, where uh, are coming people uh, from all over the world uh, to live there. And uh, in our team that is uh, uh, in Berlin uh, with uh, around 50 people in Berlin, we have uh, 25 uh, different nations there, uh, which is just uh, showing you um, this uh, fortune that we have uh, in a different backgrounds, different cultures, uh, yeah. uh, really creates uh, a fantastic environment uh, to work in. 
Well, speaking of developers, it appears that you're also reaching out to developers beyond your uh, company borders with uh, an end-to-end uh, integration API. Can you tell us what this is about and how you hope uh, developers will use it? Uh, thank you very much uh, for bringing uh, that one up. Uh, this is something we will be focusing uh, quite a lot from beginning of uh, the next year. Uh, current API uh, that we have uh, together with uh, documentation, uh, which we have uh, is uh, still in its uh, early stage. Uh, so uh, there uh, I beg for a bit of a patience and forgiveness uh, from uh, developers uh, that jump on it uh, right away. And uh, I hope <laughs> as well that they're going to be rewarded uh, heavily for uh, that one uh, being among uh, the early ones. Uh, so what is quite unique about uh, this API is uh, that it's basically extending end-to-end uh, encryption platform. And uh, this is uh, the first one uh, that we know of uh, doing uh, uh, all of the integrations uh, in the highest uh, possible uh, secure way. So that's currently in beta, there's code examples, but you're saying this is, this is kind of in rapid changing phase or active development? Uh, exactly. So uh, there, um, uh, please stay tuned. And um, basically, in, uh, during the first uh, quarter of the year, uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll make it also available API in a number of uh, more programming uh, languages and uh, as well uh, documentation, uh, which is a pretty scarce there, uh, will be at the level uh, where it should be. One thing that I'm struck by, we mentioned it with the domain and the design and the emphasis on the native clients, um, everything that you're doing seems very intentional. And so one question we often ask guests on this show is, you know, what kind of open source project are they? Because they, you know, open source is not one size fits all. And especially with businesses with open source products, often they're, they're different in their DNA, even though the code is, is all viewable and the license may be very favorable and all that. But uh, is wire open source like you can view our source and you can clone our source or is it open source like we want everybody to be working on this together as a community? How does it look from the outside? What do you expect? So um, in in a first phase, uh, it was uh, uh, more about uh, being uh, transparent uh, because in order uh, to attract a number of users uh, to develop on the top of your code and uh, around your code, uh, uh, you need uh, to uh, provide them um, necessary uh, attention and uh, also attention uh, which they deserve uh, in order uh, to create uh, great value for um, you and uh, also in the same way uh, to uh, create it uh, uh, for them. And um, as, uh, as we are moving uh, further, this is where is going to be our focus and uh, uh, also a bit of exclusive information is uh, that uh, for uh, some parts of the code uh, uh, we are likely uh, to go uh, with a less restrictive uh, license uh, uh, than GPL uh, v3 but uh, I'll be really glad uh, to talk about it uh, more uh, hopefully in the next year when we talk again. I'm kind of curious too to Jared's point you know when you when you're open source, there's, it's not one size fits all. And, you know, in a lot of cases, you know, you've kind of come up in a different scenario where you have deep roots in, you know, in what we talked about earlier, which was the, uh, the internet protocol, the, the internet low bit rate code, the ILBC, you know, kind of getting your grassroots into open source there, kind of seeing a big win, garnering a community, ultimately turning into WebRTC and in this case, it's slightly different because it seems like it's, it's sometimes sometimes you describe it as as open core or open source, and you build a business around the open source you you develop. Is your hope maybe from coming on a show like this, where you speak to a pretty diverse audience of developers, and highly likely that they really care about open source because they're listening to the change log? Is your hope that um, you know one you get a lot of new users or not a lot of new eyeballs on what you're working on, but also potentially developing a community around it. Cause that's the one piece I see missing. And, and as Jared said, you're very intentional and very clear with your speech and what, who you are. The community aspect is the one that seems to be missing. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent point. Uh, and uh, this is the part uh, that I'm uh, 
personally uh, quite excited about uh, and uh, also uh, we're um, a number of our investors are excited about and also uh, uh, my colleagues so compared to um, some of uh, the other uh, secure um, solutions uh, provider um, at uh, wire also uh, we believe in a federated approach and um, also uh, there what you see in vicinity is that uh, some more of verticals that are emerging need also to deploy end-to-end -end encryption, uh, such as uh, automotive, um, especially with the driverless cars, connected home, uh, digital health, etc. So um, uh, our vision there is uh, that the um, messaging platform uh, will be interoperating with all those. And uh, there in a similar way as um, we had previously a WebRTC, we see that uh, there is gonna be a big need uh, for a secure protocol solution that will be uh, connecting those different uh, islands uh, and uh, further fostering uh, innovation as we are gonna be um, crossing uh, those different uh, verticals. And uh, as you notice, and as you've seen, uh, we always love uh, to think uh, big and uh, to think some years ahead of us. Uh, and this is, this is something uh, where we are quite committed uh, and excited about uh, this federated approach. Uh, also, again, uh, taking uh, parts of uh, our intellectual property uh, to uh, standardization and then uh, by enabling uh, the whole world around us, uh, create also um, more business uh, for us and uh, also bring uh, more value uh, to our shareholders. And uh, there, nothing happens uh, without uh, good community support and uh, we'll make sure that um, we address community around us uh, in the right way and uh, also to attract a wide uh, community and give them a, a really uh, exciting uh, platform uh, to work on. You might get a chance uh, to do that in a deeper scale. I'm reading further into uh, wire.com slash security, which we refer referenced a couple of times earlier in the show, which we also will link up in the show notes, but down in your transparency area, uh, you mentioned that you're, you're open source, that you're GPL version three licensed. Uh, but then you also mentioned in that same sentence or in that same paragraph, uh, a self-hosted server option, which I imagine you know, is intended for someone to install themselves, you know, onto their own cloud as they see fit. Um, this is coming in 2018. Can you kind of maybe tee up this horizon, this future that you're you're building towards? Mm -hmm. uh, also, excellent point and point that I'm quite excited uh, uh, to talk about. Uh, so, there, this federated approach is. Uh, uh, something uh, where, where we see massive uh, value and uh, uh, where, um, where we see a big opportunity, uh, not only uh, for a wire, but also for a number of other companies, because uh, uh, we really don't believe in uh, one ring uh, to rule them all. And uh, we do not think uh, that uh, people are going to be using one solution, whether it is uh, from Facebook or uh, Google or Microsoft or Apple for all those verticals uh, for consumer messaging, for a business messaging, uh, for large enterprise messaging, uh, for uh, messaging uh, towards uh, the uh, uh, automotive uh, uh, with a connected uh, home, uh, etc. So um, as, as you've seen uh, with uh, our backend, uh, it is uh, quite nicely written code. Uh, is roughly like 30,000 lines of a Haskell code, uh, and it should be possible uh, to port it also on a lower footprint devices uh, or servers. Uh, right. So there I'm, I'm really excited uh, about the uh, potential that this is bringing uh, uh, into the future and uh, about all of the innovation uh, that can uh, happen around it. Very good. Any uh, any closing thoughts for those listening? Uh, any ways to get involved? Any inroads? Obviously, you got a a medium blog people could be reading. You've got a couple different things people can go check out in terms of your code base. 
that is at github.com slash wire app app. We'll link that up in the show notes, of course, but uh, any other places where we can send people to, to kind of catch up further on what you're up to. Uh, our Twitter account is uh, definitely uh, one, one of the places uh, where um, uh, you can stay uh, up to date uh, with all of uh, the news that are uh, happening around wire and the, the other ones uh, that you mentioned uh, are uh, uh, the ones uh, that are really good uh, uh, for a starting point uh, and uh, as well uh, please uh, stay tuned uh, related uh, to um, an API platform uh, that uh, uh, will um, be um, uh, deploying in 2018 uh, and uh, there especially uh, we value all the feedback uh, related uh, uh, to wire application, uh, privacy policy, uh, terms and conditions, uh, features that are missing, and especially about the things uh, that are not working well and uh, that uh, can be uh, improved. And uh, Twitter there is a perfect channel to uh, pass it back to us. Excellent. That's actually a nice Twitter handle too, twitter.com slash wire. So I did it all. you've really, aside from GitHub, aside from GitHub, you got wire app on GitHub, but that's okay. You can't have wire everywhere. Maybe you can. We'll see. We we missed it uh, by a little bit uh, on a GitHub. There you go. Well, Alan, thank you so much for sharing your time with us and walking us through the you know some of the history to the earlier protocols, the the earlier conversation around Skype. That's always enlightening to kind of you know peel back the layers to a tool we've used for years and and rely upon. And I have to say, uh, during this conversation. Wire seems pretty awesome, and I can't wait for maybe a you know some features that are focused towards uh, podcasters that can make our jobs a little easier and secure. So, mm. <laughs> Alan, thank you so much for your time, and uh, appreciate it. Thank you very much uh, for uh, having me uh, in your uh, podcast, and uh, would be uh, delighted uh, to hear a bit more on the uh, requirements, uh, also uh, to make uh, Wire your. Uh, tool of choice uh, for the podcast we'll do for sure we'll share all all of our dreams and we will hope you make them true thank you so much all right that's it for this episode of the change log if you enjoyed the show share it with a friend read us an apple podcast go on overcast and favorite it tweet about it smoke signal it whatever it takes share it with a friend thank you to our sponsors bug snag digital ocean go cd and top Tile. Also, thanks to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. We host everything we do on Linode cloud servers. Head to Linode.com slash changelog. Check them out. Support the show. The changelog is hosted by myself, Adam Stachowiak, and Jared Santo. Editing is done by Jonathan Youngblood. And our awesome music is produced by Breakmaster Cylinder. Head to changelog.com to find more episodes just like this. Or head to your favorite podcast app and click subscribe. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.